story is told of a new minister who was just come to a new assignment in a new town. His first week on the job, he was asked by the funeral director to provide a graveside service for a homeless man who had died without family or friends. He would be buried in a cemetery far out in the countryside. Being new to the area, he got lost. And being a man, he didn't ask for directions. He showed up to the graveside an hour late. He saw the backhoe in place, saw the workers eating their lunch, but the hearse was nowhere in sight. Got out, apologized to the workers, went over to the open grave, saw that they had already placed the vault lid on top, gathered the workers around and said, you know, I won't take long, but it's the right and proper thing to say a few words. And so this young minister preached his heart out. And the workers said, amen, and praise the Lord, and hallelujah. He concluded the service with a prayer, went back to his car, and as he was getting in, he overheard one of the workers say, you know, I have never seen anything quite like that before. And I've been putting in septic systems for 20 years. <laughs> When we don't ask for directions, we can get in trouble. Asking directions and our readings from two prophets have something in common. Let's take a look. The question of what God wants of us is a question that people have wrestled with throughout the ages. It wasn't just the ancient Jews who pondered this conundrum. It was puzzled over by people worldwide, from philosophers to priests, from kings to commoners. What does God want is a universal question, but with a singular answer that has been shared across different cultures and belief systems. That answer? Sacrifice. God wants sacrifice. The ancient Sumerians from whom Abraham came believed the answer to what God wanted was food. Yes, our job as humans was to keep those hungry gods fed by our sacrifices. The ancient Vedas of India also had numerous gods and goddesses and a sacrificial system of appeasement that mollified them. Animal sacrifices were less common than elsewhere, but valuable milk, butter, grains, and spices were offered instead. Ancient Greeks and Romans believed one way of getting on a particular god's or goddess's good side was to offer them something of value. The notion that gods or goddesses wished sacrifices offered to them was a common idea. And some cultures such as the Celts or ancient Aztecs even had human sacrifices offered. Given the prevalence of sacrificial systems in the ancient world, it's no surprise to see something similar within Judaism. The book of Leviticus is dedicated to enumerating the different kinds of sacrifices, whether animal, grain, or wine, and for what purposes, whether they're guilt offerings, or peace offerings, or something else. Chapter after chapter, page after page in Leviticus and elsewhere details the specific type of animals that are acceptable to the Lord, and the manner in which they are to be sacrificed. It is clear, however, that the Jews did not believe their offerings were actually feeding God. It is also clear that while their neighbors, the Canaanites, might have practiced human sacrifice, such was forbidden within Judaism. One across-the-board answer to what God wants was this, sacrifice.
is this really what God wants? That's the question Micah poses in our reading. With what shall I come before the Lord? Burnt offerings, calves a year old, thousands of rams, rivers of oil, even my firstborn child? The proposed offerings are comprehensive. Burnt offerings represent total dedication. Year-old cows were the most desirable sacrificial animal there was. Thousands of rams and rivers of oil were lavish expenditures. And the firstborn child represented one's most precious possession. The implied answer to these proposed offerings is no. Not because sacrifices were inherently wrong, but because without a proper relationship to God and neighbor, they were useless. Pagan gods and goddesses cared about you as long as you kept the sacrifices coming, but couldn't care less about your neighbors. So why should you? The God of Israel, however, wasn't so petty as to be bought off with sacrifices and had an abiding interest in the welfare of neighbors, and therefore so should the people of Israel. Those neighbors of Israel weren't just fellow Jews, but widows orphans and strangers to whom God's care extended within and beyond the boundaries of the promised land. It is out of that prophetic stance that Micah gives God's answer to the question of what God wants. The people of Israel are claiming ignorance of what God wants. They're claiming to be lost. Should we bring this or that or something else? Micah reminds them God has already shown them what God requires. God has told you, O mortal, what is good. The prophet uses an unusual form of address, O mortal, which in Hebrew reads, O Adam, as in Adam and Eve. This uncommon address offers two possible points of emphasis. First, the use of Adam may simply be to stress our creatureliness over against God's divinity. But there is a second possibility. The inclusivity of the term Adam may also point to the universality of God's expectations for all of us mortals, all humans, even those who don't know the story of Adam, are expected to live by what the prophet says. Within a sacrificial system, Micah emphasizes universal principles about a proper relationship to God and neighbors. Micah gives three succinct answers to the question of what God wants. They are soundbite snippets of heavenly wisdom that are among the best remembered parts of this book. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Do right, be loving, walk humbly. If we think of these three movements as steps along the path God would have us follow, it can help frame our thoughts and actions. Let's start with the step that probably most naturally comes to us, loving mercy. God wants us to be merciful, for God is merciful. We are to be merciful not out of duty or obligation, but because we love mercy. For mercy is what love requires. Being merciful comes from our compassionate heart and is an emotional response. Loving mercy means we'll be called tender-hearted. One way to illustrate this is to think of a river into which beaten and bloodied people are floating downstream. Upon seeing such, our heart goes out. Our first instinct would be to swim out and rescue them, to bring them ashore and tend to their wounds. It's an emotional response. We see the need and we act on it. It's an individual focus on present needs and tries to answer the question of what is loving? It's giving a person a fish to eat when they are hungry. Someone calls such loving mercy charity or from the Latin word caritas or love. It's giving direct social services such as serving at Walnut Hills or over the Rhine soup kitchens 
tutoring children in our community at Hopewell or Adena Elementary, or donating food or funds to our on-site food pantry, or helping hands fund. Doing loving deeds of mercy may get you called a saint by the larger society. Loving mercy is one step in the path God would have us take. There's a second step as well, doing justice. It may not come as easily or naturally as loving mercy, but it's a step we must take nonetheless. God wants us to do justice, to do what's right, not just morally, but socially. It's looking out upon this vast world and asking, since God is a just God, a God who does what's right, what would a just world look like? It's a systemic analysis of our world that comes from our inquisitive mind and is a rational response. Doing justice means we'll be called tough-minded. One way to illustrate this is to imagine that the rescuer of bloodied people in the river would eventually ask the questions, where are they coming from? Who's putting them here? How can I prevent more from happening? It's a rational response to seek beyond the individual need to discover the cause, to find the source of the hurt in the river. It's a social focus on long-term needs and tries to answer the question of what is fair. It's teaching a person to fish so that they might eat beyond that day. Some would call such righteous deeds on behalf of others social change. It's participating in community self-help projects like Habitat for Humanity, advocating for just public policies like a living wage, holding Ohio legislators accountable for an equitable funding of public schools, and developing local community enterprises like food banks or co-ops. Doing deeds of justice may get you called a subversive by the larger society. Doing justice is another step in the path God would have us take. Micah's third step is walking humbly with God. It may not come as easily as acts of mercy or deeds of justice, but without it, we're just two left feet. God wants us to walk humbly with the Lord. It's in this final step that Habakkuk's reading comes into play. Habakkuk says, though the fig tree doesn't blossom, no fruits on the vine, the produce of the olive fails, fields yield no food, the flocks cut off from the fold, and there's no herd in the stalls. The prophet Habakkuk vividly sketches that we live in a world not of our own making in a vast web of interdependent relationships with the Earth's plants and animals. It's looking out upon creation and its creatures and acknowledging our dependency upon the Creator. For nature is God's way of providing for our needs anonymously. It's a spiritual response to the world in which we find ourselves Walking humbly means we'll be known as someone with a yielded spirit. Another way to illustrate this is to ask, who is the source of the river? It's a theological focus on eternal needs and tries to answer the question of identity. Who am I in relationship to God? It's finding yourself caught in the net of God's mercy among others who have been caught there in a message proclaimed by fishermen. Walking humbly doesn't only mean walking with God when times are good, but also when figs, fruit, fields, and flocks fail. Walking humbly means our relationship to, to God isn't based on what we get, but on what we give. Walking humbly means acknowledging that God is the Lord of our lives in all circumstances, good and bad alike. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed 
be the name of the Lord, as Job says. We hear an echo of that same sentiment in Habakkuk that even when all the interdependent relationships with plants and animals fail, the dependent relationship we have with God never will. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation, for God the Lord is my strength. Despite all our rejections, we can rejoice in the Lord. Despite our existential angst, we can exult in the God of our salvation. Despite all our stresses, God remains our strength. Despite our circumstances, we can make a choice to rejoice precisely because of who God is. Walking humbly with God means we don't confuse our external circumstances with the eternal plans God has for us. When we walk humbly with God, prosperity or adversity doesn't affect our relationship with God. Walking humbly with God may get you called a servant by those who know its meaning. Micah gives simple directions for those who are lost and wondering what God wants and wondering where we're headed. Sacrifices will need to be made as we make our way forward into the future. Isn't it interesting that when God is asked what God requires, God doesn't give the answer in this order. Walk humbly with God, love mercy, and do justice. Instead, God says, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. The order is important, as well as the ratio. What God requires first and foremost are acts of justice and deeds of mercy. How we are to relate to our community and larger world. Then, and only then, does God mention how we are to relate to the Lord. It's a two to one ratio of justice and mercy to neighbors over humility to God. Maybe God's trying to tell us something. That if we bandage the wounded and work to eradicate the causes of suffering in the world, people will come to know God through us. If we demonstrate mercy and justice in such a visible way to our neighbors, they'll find a path to the Lord. Most people outside churches believe we love the Lord, but they're unsure whether we love them as much as God. What would it take to change their mind? What will you do to reach their heart what does God want? You know the answer. Amen. If you're looking to direct your steps onto the path of the Lord, we'd invite you to come forward as we sing, What Does the Lord Require of You? Please stand as you're able. Okay, there's some.